Yeah. Okay. Time to start our uh, uh, work session. Thank you all for coming. Okay, and I'll start off here. Uh, Dave attended a uh, hazard mitigation meeting that was held at the community center. Uh, the county, FEMA, SEMO Regional Planning was there. And, uh, and, and, and from that meeting, uh, we, we discovered that um, we need to have a hazard mitigation plan uh, in the future if we want to stay qualified for FEMA assistance in the event of a uh, disaster of one kind or another. And Dave came back and said, we need to pass this resolution. And the resolution said, we're approving a plan. Well, there was no plan in evidence here. So rather than me trying to describe to you why it's important we do that, Drew Christian from SEMO Regional Planning and Economic Development is here. He's going to come to the microphone, and he's going to give you the explanation of why this item that's on your agenda for tonight should be given consideration. So, uh, just a really quick background. Um, I am Drew Christian with SEMO RPC out of Perryville. Um, we contract with SEMA to update the hazard mitigation plans for our seven counties. It happens every five years. Um, the, the, the update of the plan is paid for 75% by FEMA, and then there's 25% that is paid in match by the jurisdictions. Um, so there's no cost to any of the jurisdictions. Um, you do have to have a FEMA-approved hazard mitigation plan to be eligible for FEMA hazard mitigation grant assistance. So when you want to build a safe room, do a flood buyout, uh, if you're wanting to get a FEMA grant for uh, early warning sirens, emergency generators, um, any, any of those activities, if you're wanting to apply for the FEMA grants, um, to even be able to apply, you have to have a FEMA-approved hazard mitigation plan. Um, so one of the new requirements in this latest update um, is that jurisdictions have to, when I send the plan to SEMA for the first review, SEMA requires that I also send in all of the adoption resolutions for all of the participating jurisdictions, which are the county, uh, the cities, and school districts, if they choose to apply. This is completely uh, optional, but if you do not participate, you're not eligible for the grants. Um, so I have to send in the adoption resolutions when I send in the first draft of the plan. Um, Years ago, they would, um, they would allow a jurisdiction to send in an adoption resolution um, four years after the plan was done when they decided that they wanted to apply for a grant. And SEMA said, you know, that's not really in the spirit of the whole planning process. If you've gone through the planning process, you've participated, which the city has um, up to this point, then there's really no reason for you not to pass an adoption resolution within a close proximity of time to having submitted all of your actions and your um, assessment of all of the hazards. Um, and it, it really doesn't make sense for you to go through all of that planning process and then four years later you're going to adopt the plan that you uh, helped create. Um, so they said, well, we're not going to do that anymore. They've moved to um, if you have participated and you've done all of this, then we're going to they're going to require um, that you adopt the plan prior to the first draft even being sent in. Um, some of the RPCs did kind of uh, suggest to FEMA that that was a little bit odd to adopt a plan that doesn't even, um, you know, necessarily it, it's first draft. Uh, and that's not usual for any jurisdiction to do, um, to which SEMA told us that this was their new requirement and this is how they're doing it. Um, you are not the first jurisdiction to kind of question, hey, now do what? Um, we've got others that have been passed in this way. Um, what I can tell you is that the hazard mitigation plan is like I... For cities, I always compare it to a comp plan. Um, in your comprehensive plan, you might say, 
we want to, uh, in your major street plan, we're going to construct, uh, you know, a road between First Street and Second Street. Twenty years later, that road between First Street and Second Street still doesn't exist. Okay, there's, there's, there's no, uh, nobody's coming after you. Nobody's suing you. You're not in any kind of trouble. It was a plan. Your plan said we think we'd like to do this. It was based on the assumption that something was going to happen or something was going to remain the same, and then it didn't happen. You thought there was going to be a development. You thought there was going to be funds available, and those funds never showed up, or the development didn't happen, or all of that stuff happened, and you just decided, ah, you know what, we don't need it. We got other priorities over here. Okay, that's fine. No, you're not in any kind of trouble. Nobody's coming down on you. Um, the hazard mitigation plan is basically, it, it's the same as that. Um, it does have actions uh, of, what the, of what the city would like to do to mitigate the effects of hazards. So one action might be uh, construct a safe room or purchase emergency generators or buy out flood prone property. Um, SEMA reviews it, FEMA reviews it, FEMA approves it. Uh, but basically what that means is that um, I kind of say there's two types of data in the plan, two types of information. One is what the city provides or each jurisdiction provides to me. And then the other is kind of the, um, the federal requirements. So there has to be a discussion of the risk map update. There has to be a discussion of uh, population trends from the Census Bureau. And so um, when FEMA approves it, they're not they're not saying they like your actions. They're not saying they don't like them. They're just saying that this plan checks the boxes in the federal register. Um, you don't put anything in the plan that you don't want in the plan. Uh, if you don't want to even consider purchasing emergency generators in the next five years, you don't put that action in. Um, if you think it's something you would like to consider, you put it in the plan. If it never happens, never happens. Um, FEMA doesn't come back and say, you said you were going to do this, but you didn't do it. You didn't say you were going to do it. You said that this is something you're going to consider, assuming that everything works out the way you want it to work out. Um, so it doesn't bind the city to anything. Um, the other participating jurisdictions, like St. Mary's, the school district, the county, um, whatever they put in the plan, that, that applies to them. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Um, so it's basically an opportunity for, uh, the city to provide a little bit of information. There's a couple of questionnaires that are being filled out. Um, you provide some actions that you would, as a city, like to consider. Um, and then for free, you're now eligible for the next five years for grant funds from FEMA is, is basically what it boils down to. Um, no obligation, no cost. Um, I will say if you choose not to participate and then um, say next year you decide, hey, we really would like to apply for that grant, you can be updated into the plan um, on, an, on an annual basis. We can add in jurisdictions that didn't participate, but after this, this period is over, FEMA will no longer be paying for it. So then we as the RPC will have to charge the city to incorporate the city into the plan. Um, so basically right now, you get it for free. Um, and there's, like I say, there's no obligation to you. There is no requirement. You do not have to do it. Um, but for no cost and no obligation, um, I would strongly urge you to just uh, go ahead and participate in the plan and then you're covered for the next five years. Yes, sir. That's kind of a real hard burn vote for something I can't see. That's um, like voting on a budget when you don't know how much money you got. The previous plan is up on the SEMO RPC website. Um, now, I will say that, that SEMA has changed the template, so the layout is basically completely different. Chapters are all moved around. Um, it's the same type of information, demographic, uh, historic properties, uh, endangered species. It's got just kind of that boilerplate information in it. Um, 
and then uh, again you can see whatever information that uh, the city staff is submitting um, I don't change anything uh, FEMA doesn't change anything um, now they do they do request revisions uh, typically on the information that I submit um, you know they don't like that I missed crossing a T um, so they'll come back and you know your your description of the risk map needs to be updated with this new language that we've developed all right um, but that has no impact on anything that you guys are doing it just basically says oh these counties in the state are now done with their risk map so um, any other questions yes sir you know um, this sounds like kind of a no-brainer in a way but there's got to be some downside somewhere but is there uh, the downside is if you don't participate you don't you're not eligible for grants Right. What if we pass the resolution and then don't develop the plan? Um, I don't. Well, that would be. Uh, there will be a plan uh, for the school district. Well, it may or may not include a provision for for the city based on the city's contribution. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you wanted to pass an adoption resolution and then provide me no information, uh, then yeah, you're not a participant and you're not eligible for grants. Uh, the the downside to passing the resolution, uh, there is literally zero. It's the same. It, it's the same thing as if you pass a comp plan. I am not aware of any downsides to having a comp plan. It's all upside. Except in this case, nobody's charging you to develop the comp plan. We're just doing it for free because FEMA's paying for it. Um, if there is a downside, I've never heard of one. We have uh, multiple jurisdictions across multiple counties that have all adopted their plans. They have Perry County uh, School District is on their second safe room. Um, City of Jackson built a safe room um, uh, the city has I believe gotten grants in the past for flood buyouts um, so it, this isn't anything new at all uh, it's just a weird requirement right right this is I think the third or fourth update to your plan that we have done that has yet to be developed right that's what I don't understand if it's that simple somebody give us a place but yet you said it's not binding I would assume it's not binding in either direction, correct? We, Meaning we can adopt the or pass a resolution, but you you said earlier that it was anything is non -bi not binding or non binding, and that it's a, it's just a plan, just like our comp plan. So mm -hmm. it's non binding if we develop something and don't follow it, and it's not it's no non binding if we adopt the resolution okay. but don't contribute to it either way it's non-binding it's just one way we don't qualify for FEMA grants one way we do right yeah but either I mean way, it's still non binding if uh, basically what you're adopting is the language that David and Martin are going to send to me um, so uh, I'm just going to kind of speculate here there's probably an action for I don't know emergency generators okay so um, basically the action is going to be that the city uh, would purchase emergency generators for City Hall um, that is the exact same thing as saying we're gonna build a street between first street and second street if you never do it five years from now the only thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna go in the plan and I'm gonna say the action to purchase emergency generators not completed because funding didn't materialize all right you can put it in in the next five year update uh, I mean a lot of the actions that you already have in the plan are going to carry forward if you want them to like I said this is not this is not new this is your third or fourth update to the plan um, it's just this time instead of being able to wait 
basically four years, 364 days to, to uh, adopt the plan, you have to do it before the first draft. Other than the, uh, you know, it, it, what Jimmy said, it's, it's a little peculiar, but you know, I've talked to Mark, he doesn't see a problem with doing this. So, and every, everybody's, the county's done it, everybody's done it. I think we'd be foolish not to, if, especially if it's not gonna, you know, see where it's gonna hurt us at all. And it's only going to benefit us because there are some things that we could apply for and we need to do. And there are no, um, uh, there's no, I guess, like political language in it. Yeah. Um, there's no, there's nothing that would come back, uh, you know, and have people saying, oh, so the city supports doing or not doing something. Um, it's just basically, um, what are you handing out there? This is an existing plan if anybody wants to peruse it. It's just uh, be a quiz yeah. on that yeah. tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, it's done before the meeting. You know, it's got uh, like I say, census data in it um, from NOAA. I get uh, all of the hazard events, um, but you know, those are public record. You know, it's ju it's just it's kind of the factual yeah. stuff. Yes. Um, you know, there's this many people. There's this many people that are over 65, that are under five years old. There have been this many tornadoes, you know. Um, it's just kind of a factual plan. There's no, there's no, there's no policy to it, really, other than just Listen to him, and then there's an item. the actions that you guys want to include. When's the deadline for this? Um, as soon as possible. Uh, the plan has, the previous plan has actually expired. Um, uh, which is act, happens very frequently given the the pace that a lot of this moves at. Um, but the other jurisdictions, you know, will want the plan submitted soon in case they want to apply for any grants in this cycle. Um, but it's not going tomorrow or anything to SEMA. Um, but sooner rather than later would be would be good. Should call this at the end of the five year period an update. Mm -hmm. You know, take for instance, you know, you talked about this connecting first to second street at the end of that five year period. We think that's non feasible. We want to connect second to third street. I mean, is that a pretty simple process or? It's, it's called an update. It's, uh, it's not a completely new plan, but your actions, um, I go through and and you know we look at okay you've completed these um, you have not completed these you can either say what well, we didn't do we want to keep it in or, or you can say we didn't do it and we don't even want to mess with it anymore um, you know maybe you decide that no the city's the city doesn't want to construct a safe room after all so we just take it out I mean it but I mean in, in addition to that if we want to add something not in the first plan sure yeah. okay yeah I mean you can and you can apply um, for FEMA grants for something for an action that is not in your plan um, the one thing that I do caution jurisdictions on is FEMA will look so let's say you don't include a safe room as an action item um, FEMA and then you apply for safe room funding uh, FEMA will look at the plan and they'll see, well, you didn't include a safe room as an action, why not? Um, I kind of tell people it's a little bit difficult to say, well, there was no way we could conceive that the city would want to build a safe room. I mean, it's, if I was FEMA, that would be a tough sell to me that there was, that, that the city just, there was no way they could imagine wanting a safe room anywhere in the city. Like, you know not even like maybe a little bit um, on the other hand something like say uh, a sinkhole opens up and you want to do some improvements to that sinkhole and there there's not a sinkhole anywhere within a mile okay well now it's pretty easy to tell FEMA okay we want some funds to help improve this sinkhole why wasn't it an action already in the plan because nobody knew that this was even a, a, a possible event over here so I, I kind of use those two examples as um, you know you can apply for something that's not in the plan you cannot do something that you did put in the plan 
Um, but again, because there's because it doesn't bind you to anything, um, I do suggest that kind of the low hanging fruit, go ahead and put an action for it. Safe room, sirens, generators, um, just because if four years from now you do decide, hey, we want to put a, an early warning siren up, it's already in. And if you decide, no, we don't want to, no big deal. You just don't do it. So if this is in the plan and it's guaranteed funding. No. Mm -hmm. no. No. No, it is a grant application process that is competitive across the entire nation. So we, we have to do it up front, carry out the plan first, and then, then apply for the Right, plan. right, yeah. This adopting the plan means that you are eligible to apply for a grant. Well, it, it in no way guarantees any kind of funding at all. But if you do not adopt the, and participate in the plan, you can't even submit an application to apply for the grant. So uh, adopt the plan and you have a chance at a grant. Don't adopt it and there is a 100% chance you will not get funding because you cannot apply. So we would get funding before we would uh, take, do the plan, right? Or we'd have to do it first and then apply for reimbursement. Uh, the FEMA correct? grants, I don't, I don't, I do the hazard mitigation plan. I don't do the hazard mitigation grants. Um, right. So I don't recall if those are, I think those are reimbursable. So yes, if you were going to build a safe room, yeah, the city would have to uh, apply for reimbursement from FEMA as you were doing it, yeah, I think. <clears throat> yeah, right, thanks. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. So uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, the city attorney is going to discuss uh, nuisance abatement and special tax bills as he promised at our last meeting. So <clears throat> I just put together a very rough PowerPoint, more or less, to keep me organized. So I provided that to you today. Or, or as. So I'm going to talk about a number of, of issues. I wasn't exactly sure exactly, you know, what you're looking for for information. So I kind of went through the whole process a little bit. <coughs> Go through it pretty fast. If 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 I if you don't understand or have any questions, please interrupt me. So there's I'm going to go through the statutory authority. Our ordinances in a, in a general scope, um, the special tax bill law and the specifics about that, and then the, the collection efforts that we can take uh, based upon the um, special tax bill. So the first three pages uh, describe the statutory authority. So the cities are an operation of a, a political subdivision of the states. So we have authority as is granted to us generally by the state of Missouri. And uh, three statutes that primarily deal with these issues. There's a lot of overlap, especially the first two. And I'm not sure why they have uh, multiple statutes that deal with uh, a lot of the same subjects. But uh, 67.398 uh, revised statutes. I didn't include a copy of it, uh, but you can certainly look it up. Uh, that's mainly a trash and debris, uh, nuisance type of situation, overgrown grass and weeds. And they empower the cities to uh, remediate uh, those issues after a certain process, and that the expenses of that are considered that can be placed as a lien or a special tax bill and be considered a lien on their real estate, and it's a personal debt against the owners. Uh, so the the collection this statute says the collections efforts are governed by the general laws uh, with regard to delinquent and back taxes. Um, a very similar statute to 71.285, which again deals with weeds or trash. The city, but this talks about the city's removal of those a little more specifically, and it also allows for an interest rate from when <coughs> the uh, bill was not paid in full. But otherwise, there's a lot of overlap between those two statutes that, that provide us with the authority. Um, again, there's, a, there's another uh, 71.780 is another statute that. Uh, allows us to abate nuisances and apply them as a special tax bill against the property and, and also uh, deems it a personal debt 
against the um, against the owners, which is important when we get to the collection efforts. Um, and then 67.410 deals specifically with dangerous buildings. It's a little bit more complicated. And, and you only really see uh, litigation involving cities doing this the wrong way with regard to dangerous buildings. There's very few cases, but the cases that are dealt with, um, I remember one out of Kansas City that I was involved with was just a case that went on appeal because they didn't follow the proper procedures. They demolished the building. It had some value. And they didn't do it right. So not only did they have the expense of demolishing the building, but then they had civil liability for demolishing somebody's building. And they didn't follow the notice requirements and all that. Um, and so there are specific provisions about um, how to notify the, the owners and what, what the standards are. Our, our ordinances uh, <coughs> mirror these statutes. So they're, they're all uh, written well. And, and so I'm going to go to the, to the next one, which is the city of St. Genevieve ordinances with regard to nuisance abatements. I'm going real fast, so slow me down. I, I kind of figured you wanted more of a pretty quick overview, and then we can go from there. So uh, our uh, ordinances regarding nuisance, as you all may already know, is under um, 215. So 215.010 has the nuisance definitions, which is uh, kind of a garden variety uh, kitchen sink nuisance ordinance, which tries to describe anything that we can envision being a proper nuisance that, or an improper nuisance, I guess is what you may say, that we can take action on. The <clears throat> so when there isn't a, nu a nuisance there, there is a process generally uh, to abate the nuisance. You have to give notice to the property owners. And when I'm involved in these from the front end and in my other cities, generally they, they say, hey, we got this property. And when I'm involved in the front end, I always insist on getting a title search because there's some questions about a particular case uh, before the meeting began because you have to notify the property owners. Uh, and, and sometimes it's not really obvious, okay, who, who actually has an ownership interest in the, in the property. Because you have to give a, a notice to all of them. There could be one person living there that owns it, but also another person that has an ownership interest that doesn't live there. You have to notify all of them um, uh, that there is a nuisance there. Uh, there are shorter timelines for this general nuisance abatement as opposed to the, the building, uh, dangerous building uh, provisions. Uh, so we have to give them a notice, notice uh, for them to show cause, uh, at least 10 days notice. Uh, there's a hearing for this board. Yeah, let's, it, let's stop for yes. a minute. Mm -hmm. Generally, we have provided uh, notice by mail, both certified and regular, mm -hmm. and then posted on the property. Correct. That's so right. Anything else we need to try and do? No, I mean, I, I always prefer personal service if we can do that. But, uh, <coughs> but th those are the acceptable ways to provide notice. They have posted and certified. And is there a presumption that if they if you don't get a return on the regular mail and they didn't pick up the certified that they, they got they, they got the notice well you have to send it to them to you, you have to to make reasonable efforts to notify them and with regard to this particular issue where you have just a general nuisance as opposed to the dangerous building I'm talking about the dangerous building okay well so um, <laughs> I'd have to evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if you have somebody in there and we're relying on a, a non-return of mail, I'd say that's not sufficient. If they're in there, we need to get them notice. Uh, I mean, because we certainly can, because they're there. If it's an absentee landlord, we're going to have a different issue, because then we can presumably, I mean, as far as the people that are occupying it, yes. And, and the same holds true with regard to effort to notify when uh, the owners bank as with a foreclosure or well with the, the dangerous building uh, ordinance is a little bit a little bit more specific you have to provide no, notice to every person or entity that has an interest in the in the real estate so that would include a bank that has a deed of trust they would because so that's why I would really want a letter report from a title company because that's going to show up a deed of trust is going to show up it's got to notify the bank because the, the, the bank has an interest in that real estate, and when you're demolishing a building, it's going to affect the value of it. Now, it could have affected it positively, or it could affect it negatively, and they, they're entitled to that notice before we take that action. And if we don't provide those proper notices, then we don't have a right to get on that property. Because the, the, the city, it's, a, it's, it's a fairly important power of the city 
uh, and uh, a significant power of a municipality to go on somebody's property and tear down their building. And so that's why there's these protections, these notice requirements and a hearing requirement, because we could have we could you know we could have our staff here believe that it's a it's a nuisance or it's a dangerous building, but at the hearing you may say well it's it's, it's ugly or it's it's you know maybe it's, not, it's run down but it's not a nuisance. And so the, the board acts as, as that hearing officer collectively, and that gives the, the, the property owners and people that have interest in their property to come and make their case. This is not a nuisance. Um, but anyway, so I don't think that, did that answer your question? Uh, for now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then you, you have a hearing uh, here in front of the Board of Aldermen, and if, and if it, the board determines that there is a nuisance exists, they can order uh, an abatement uh, that uh, you have to give them at least 20 days notice. Uh, you can give them more. Uh, that order of abatement also has to be served on the property owner, and that time frame starts upon the service of it. Um, if that abatement does not occur, then the city can enter the property and abate the nuisance. Um, and so this is a with regard to general nuisances. This is slightly different than prop the, the dangerous buildings. Uh, once we abate the nuisance, we can have a special tax bill for the actual expenses and administrative costs for that, um, that abatement, uh, which we've done before. Um, Section 215.050, there's an emergency abatement provision. So if, uh, if there's an immediate danger, immediate danger to the health, safety, and welfare of the public, the mayor or the city administrator can order an abatement without that hearing notice. That's gonna be a rare situation. If we've let something sit for two years, we can't say, oh, it's an emergency, unless something significant has changed. Um, because you, you're basically uh, not following all the due process requirements that I talked about. Uh, I signed a couple ordinances here that I'll talk about a little bit more in detail later about the, uh, uh, the vehicle nuisance issue, uh, 215.085 and 090, but I'll really talk about them more later. So the dangerous, dangerous building, per yes? When you talk about a board approval, does that have to be unanimous, simple majority? Uh, majority. Majority vote at the conclusion of the hearing. You take a vote. Um, and there'll be uh, proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law that need to be entered into um, at the conclusion of that hearing, if that's the decision of the board. Um, and that is what is served as a show cause order. You're finding facts that there's a nuisance in these, these, this manner. You're ordered to abate it in this manner. Um, within this period of time. If you don't do so, then, um, then the city has the option to take the action. The, the orders, technically the city doesn't have to act even after ordering it to, uh, to be abated by the property owner. But what I always advise my cities uh, is that if you find that there's a, a nuisance, you go through that hearing process and you order it abated, I don't like the cities not to then abate it after that time period's done. I've never seen a case that said we have any liability if we don't abate a known uh, safety hazard. But I would have concerns with us going through the whole process without really uh, following through and abating the nuisance ourselves and doing the tax bill. Uh, but it just says we're authorized to, so we don't have to. So the danger dangerous building procedure is very similar. Um, our ordinances uh, provide for a building inspector to inspect the, pro uh, the prob problem. We have to give them uh, additional time to uh, abate that, uh, but no more than 90 days. Um, and, and that's an initial notice, and if that's not completed, then we conduct a hearing with a notice, the same notice requirements that are referenced in the other ordinance for general nuisances. And then after that hearing, if, if it's deemed to be a dangerous building, they have to uh, be completed within 30 days of that order. And then the city can enter and remediate or abate the problem at the city's expense, which would then file as a uh, special tax uh, bill. Um, there is a provision, again, with dangerous buildings, an emergency provision where we can just jump ahead if it's um, an immediate danger to the life or safety of any person. So if you have a, a facade about to collapse on Main Street, you can go in and you can, you can abate that because it can fall down and, and kill somebody. But if it's just again a house that's been sitting vacant for a couple of years you just have to follow the other, follow the other pr pr procedure uh, the nuisance vehicles provisions i don't see this used very often just because there's an expense associated with it but it, it could be a useful tool 
If if there are uh, damaged, disabled, or inoperable vehicles, that's declared it can be declared a nuisance. Uh, the city just provides a notice because they're, they're removable objects, they're personal property. We provide them with a notice that they have to be removed within seven days. Uh, if they don't, then we can go in there and we can we can remove those vehicles. We have to impound them, and they can be redeemed by the owner and there's storage fees for that. Um, and uh, if they aren't redeemed by the owner within 90 days, we can sue them to the, uh, sue, sell them for the highest to the highest bidder. Um, there's another stat, uh, ordinance that's 215-140, which is very similar, but it seems to be discussing um, a shade tree mechanic situation where you're, you're repairing a vehicle or working on a vehicle for up to 14 days. If it's over 14 days, it's a nuisance unless it's enclosed like in a garage. Um, so that's more of an ordinance violation as opposed to an innovation state. Yeah. Damaged, disabled, or inoperable established a nuisance, or does there have to be some other no, that, public that's, health or safety? Condition? That's what that's no, that's what it, the, our ordinance just says. If it's inoperable, it's a nuisance. Um, and so, uh, again, I, I caution on on doing that unless it's a, a pretty. Uh, I, I I wouldn't. Be paying attention to what you know a guy that has uh, one car out there and, and going in there and taking it or citing them um, just because it, I, I would want you to, to wait till you have somebody that has 10 cars in the front yard and they're all disabled and then you round them up and, and impound them mm -hmm. um, so that's I, I prefer you, you not use it as a one-off or one car type situation um, but it's it's again a case-by-case -case basis because there's expenses involved in all this and we'll get to whether or not you can collect on it as we get forward. Um, the, the next one I talk about is a vegetation uh, ordinance, which is a pretty standard uh, tall grass, tall weeds situation where you got to provide them with a notice, cut your grass. And technically it's a hearing it's saying, you know, come up to City Hall and explain why you shouldn't have to cut your grass. Um, it gets an administrative It's hearing. a completely administrative process. And if they don't do it, uh, then you give them notice in five days, we're going to cut your grass for you if you don't do it. Again, it's a special tax bill for the costs associated with that. Um, I see other I don't know how often we do that, but I see other cities um, a lot of times waiting to the end of the summer and do one special tax bill when they accumulate all of them. So if, they have, if you have a lot of them. And I'm sorry, if they have to cut the same grass multiple times during the year, they right, establish right. the bill till the end of the year. Right, right. You just, you just uh, do the special tax bill filing one time at the end of the cutting season uh, for, for each, each property. So that's proper. So special tax bills, we, we talked about that before. Uh, <clears throat> I don't necessarily want to go through a whole lot of detail about this issue because we've agreed with the county collector they don't have to collect in our special tax bills, which, which keeps us from uh, pursuing that avenue of collection effectively. We, we agree that they don't have to. We didn't agree that they shouldn't. Correct. We're, we're, we're saying they're not obligated pursuant to the contractual agreement to collect on the special tax bills. They certainly could help if they wanted to. Um, so the special tax bills, uh, 67.451, there was some discussion uh, from them about fees, fines, and penalties. Uh, we don't assess fees, fines, and penalties. Uh, we assess uh, the actual costs of the abatement uh, and the administrative costs associated with that. So like if we hire a subcontractor or a contractor to go out and remove the uh, and abate the nuisance, we have that expense, but then we also have a, a reasonable administrative cost for the time staff had to deal with, with hiring those people and, and getting it done. Um, but if we, we could also uh, assess fines and fees and penalties, but we can only do that if we, uh, we go, go to the voters. It's essentially a tax. So it has to be voter approved. And we don't do that. Um, so we, and I'm not, I'm not advocating that you do. Um, it, it, with the, the collection being so difficult anyway, it seems to be a waste of time and effort to add on fees, fines, and penalties. Um, and you don't often see cities that have voter approved uh, fees such as that. Um, there are certain statutory provisions about the statute limitations with regard to collecting on the special tax bills with regard to a tax sale. Um, they're, you know, redeeming the property, and, the, and there's a, uh, it's essentially a tax bill and a failure to pay the taxes, so it's a, essentially a tax sale. Uh, however, the special 
tax uh, assessments are of lower priority than the general taxes from the state and local governments. Um, so those are there, but we're not really even going to be pursuing those, although in theory we could because we could act as their own collector. But again, we have to, to wait for non-payment of taxes for three years to really go down that path. Uh, the county collector does have the authority to collect our special assessments as clear as day in section 140.680. Uh, but again, uh, just because they have the authority and power to do it doesn't mean that they are going to. Uh, and uh, Section 14690 is, um, talks about the special tax lien, uh, that it is a lien upon the property and should be enforced as any other lien against the property. So if it's sold or transferred to anybody else, um, and they have, uh, and there's a closing, the title company is not going to provide title insurance unless that special tax bill is paid. It's going to be recorded, it's going to show up in a title search. Uh, and so that's, quite frankly, how m my cities most commonly get paid if they get paid on these, is the property sells and we get paid at, at the closing. The lien priority, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You go back. <laughs> Right. Do the lien priority. So lien priority, uh, again, is the, the general taxes, then the special tax bills, other liens, which would be judgment liens, then mechanics liens, and then deeds of trust. They have not been uh, foreclosed upon already. And so, so a sale of the property for the general tax delinquency has the effect of wiping out the subordinate liens? Generally, uh, I mean, if, if the property sells for the amount of the back taxes, uh, then generally they're, you know, they, the, the property taxes that are assessed against it are going to take priority and it's going to wipe out our special tax bill. And that's most commonly what happens. Um, but usually in those situations, my cities are happy that it's been sold to somebody who may do something with the property at a tax sale. And they just tell me not to even try to redeem our interest or, or dispute that transfer because we're usually not talking about a lot of money in the nuisance abatements under like, like the grass cutting special tax bills a couple hundred dollars we just write it off and uh, and let that that happen so that we have some development in the city but that's up to the city but generally it will be wiped out from the other property taxes at a tax sale but again if it's not a tax sale if it's a, a sale to a third party then those liens have priority we're going to get paid. So that brings us to really what, what your options are for collecting, which are civil collection efforts. Um, so that means if a special tax bill remains unpaid, we can file a civil action in circuit court against the owners of the property. That's another reason why it's so important to have those notice uh, provisions fulfilled at the front end, uh, because we need to make sure that we have follow the proper procedure going forward to assess the stuff the special tax bill and then we'll sue the owners if we want to um, and obtain a judgment we obtain a judgment against a, it's just like any other judgment a breach of contract or a personal injury claim you, see you have a judgment against them and you can then as i told my clients the judgment is just a piece of paper then you have to collect on it so that's uh, in the form of garnishment of their wages if they're employed somewhere garnishment of their bank accounts if they have assets in an account uh, we can do an execution on the real estate, that real estate or other real estate they own in the county or in other counties. Um, the collection efforts in these cases are, om are almost universally difficult because if they had the resources to pay the judgment, and the, they would have cut the grass. You know, if they had the wherewithal to have those assets, they would have taken care of the property better generally. It's not universally the case. But most of the grass cutting cases, you're talking about somebody died and left the house in limbo, and uh, you know, loved ones are out of town. They don't care about it, and they're just waiting for the for the tax sale. Uh, in, in that case, uh, it's it's difficult to collect on these quite often, but not impossible. Uh, but it's just like any other civil case that we handle. You make a cost benefit analysis of the costs associated with collecting, uh, seeking the, the collection efforts and the likelihood of collecting on it. Um, so the general civil action procedure. So if we go through, okay, what, what does that really mean? Well, I file a petition in a circuit court across the street. Uh, we have to serve that upon the defendants, that's the owners. Um, so if we have one person living there and three people own it, we're gonna, we're gonna sue all three people. 
We've already given them notice, especially if we're a demolition. We're probably talking about demolition cases when we're talking about that type of litigation, unless it's a serious nuisance issue, because the cost-benefit analysis of trying to collect on a $500 bill is just not there, uh, associated with the risk, associated with the costs of collection. But so you, you can't be in a situation where we, we've uh, you know, there's one person who's destitute, but the other people have assets and they're still owners of it. And so we provided them with notice we're going to do all these things. They're owners of the property. We can it's a personal liability on their part. Um, and so we can get it. Uh, we have to serve them with a copy of the petition. They have to answer within a certain period of time. If they don't, we can get a default judgment, and that's a judgment. And then we start the collection efforts, which is a form of garnishment or an execution on the property. If they hire an attorney, or if they have the wherewithal to file an answer, then we go through a civil procedure. It's a discovery, interrogatories, depositions, a trial. Uh, most commonly, you're probably talking about default judgments. And then you, once you have the judgment, then you can collect on that judgment through those civil actions, such as garnishments and executions. Um, if, if I mentioned there, if they appeal the judgment, they can file a bond, uh, which would delay the collection efforts. But then if we win on appeal, then the bond is like an insurance policy that pays the judgment. So when I get a judgment and they file an appeal and a bond, I'm happy because I know I'm getting paid, right? Uh, although I'm not happy about the delay, but I'm happy that once I get, get the, uh, the case affirmed, then I'm going to collect on it. So the, the, the costs associated with, with those kind of civil actions, the filing fee should be waived for the city uh, because it's a public entity, um, but we haven't filed one of these yet. Uh, we're going to have to have uh, a process fee for serving the defendants, <coughs> which depending on where they're at, it could be anywhere from <coughs> $50 to a couple hundred dollars, uh, depending on how much we have to track them down. There'll be attorney's fees. <coughs> Excuse me associated with all that time and work. If it's a default judgment, it's not going to be that much. If it's a trial, it's going to be a lot more. So, <coughs> so the best thing to do is at the beginning of the process, get that title report so we know who the owners are. So we can prove that they were the owners. And because really the only elements are, are you the owner of the property at the time the special tax bill, the, the abatement was done, the special tax bill was filed. <laughs> and whether we file the, prop, file the proper procedure in getting to that point. And there's really, I don't know what other defenses there are because it's an ass assessment. It's, it, we have the legal authority to assess it. And then once we get the judgment, we have to find out how to collect on it. So if they just own real estate, um, uh, yeah, I know there's, there's a situation in, in Main Street. I mean, I think that person owns real estate in a couple of different places in the county. We, can, we don't have to execute on that one. We can execute on different property. Uh, and, and we can execute to the point where we get paid our judgment. Um, and so there may be interest in an execution is basically sheriff sale. So uh, sold to the highest bidder on the courthouse steps after notice and published notice um, to the public and to the owner of the property. Um, but there's expenses with regard to the publication. It has to be in the paper. That's a couple hundred dollars for sure. Um, and so you can see those numbers add up, and, uh, and we can ask for it. attorney's fees. We'll certainly get costs, but we can ask for attorney's fees. It's up to the judge whether that's granted as part of the judgment. Um, but a lot of times, you know, what, I, what I've, I think I've said here and I've said to my other cities is when you go down this, when you start this process, you need to be responsible with the taxpayer's money about what you're going to, what work you're going to do to abate nuisances, number one. And number two, what you're, you're going to spend to try to get that money back. Because you don't want to pay double. You don't want to pay to have a nuisance fixed and then pay me to spin my wheels chasing after something I'm never going to get. Um, and I can certainly advise you on a case-by-case case, case by case basis, but, um, but first we'd have to have a title search to know okay, who for sure are the owners. And then based upon that, we can, we can do an asset, uh, at least a public record search, we can do an asset search on those people to see if they have assets. Um, and before we get started, have an idea, okay, are these people even collectible or alive? Because you have uh, you know, some property, uh, uh, like in another one of my cities is, is a very old city and there'll be, there were uh, properties that were, have been derelict for 10 plus years. And it was hard to even find anybody who was alive who knew the people, you know, uh, because it had been abandoned for some period of time before the person died and all that. So, 
So before we move yes. on to questions, mm -hmm. uh, it's clear that we're not going to get through all three items that are on our work session agenda. So are you amenable to picking it up after the regular meeting for continued continue, continue discussion? <coughs> Maybe not of this, but of the third item? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Questions? What's the break-even point dollar-wise before you would go after somebody? Before I even go down that path? Just approximately. I, I, I wouldn't want you to go just, after. Just in case. You're, ta you're talking about the dollar amount that you spent on the abatement. Right. I'm willing to mess with it for less than five grand. I mean, it's some, you have to be able to have enough to get back the expenses uh, associated with, with chasing it and the risk that you're not going to get any of it. And I wouldn't do any of it unless we're pretty firm that there is there are assets there. I wouldn't sue anybody unless I was pretty firm that we have assets either in real estate or income, some other assets, personal property, because we're going to do executions in those too. But even like the, per the, even the real estate, if they're living in the real estate, there's a homestead exemption, garnishments are exemptions too. So there are a lot of limitations on what you can collect from people so that you're not kicking their family out of their home. So, uh, but if, if they have farmland and they're living somewhere else, by all means, you know, and that's easy to find out. Yeah. Uh, if, if there's a property in town here that we don't work on, and, and especially if you know, hey, you know, the, the, the value of this is going to be beyond what we know are the debts, you know, associated with the other liens associated with it, by all means, we might as well execute on it. If nothing else, the neighbors might want to buy it, you know, at, a, at, at the execution system. Bob? Mark, you talked about the uh, the title search and stuff and finding out all the owners and stuff. You know, in the case of a nuisance, just like the vehicles, uh, are we going to say there is a financial institution involved in that property? Are we going to go ahead and notify them? So, so financial institutions normally don't like people, no. cities, after their... So, so we would not, I would not contemplate a title search on the, the rear situation where we're removing derelict vehicles and impounding them. Uh, that's, that's very close to a police action. What I'm talking about are the, the, the nuisances where we're going on the property, we're fixing, repairing, removing stuff permanently, uh, trash, uh, or demolishing a building. Then I'm just getting a title search with regard to the land records of who owns the real estate because it's a nuisance on the real estate. The vehicles are movable objects, so for those, I wouldn't do a title search on those if all we're doing is removing cars. So if somebody has 15 cars in their yard and they're unlicensed, they vehicles, and we just want to get them off the property and impound them, that, that's different than the other situations. But it wouldn't be anything more than a title search with regard to the real estate. And that we can get, I can get a letter report generally for about 150 bucks. Or less, depending on the situation. So what started this, let us hear, was a question of um, what level of review did the board want to do before we initiate hazard mitigation or code violation mitigation steps. Um, some aldermen have said, you know, it's just you're never going to get that money back. So, got, you know, you, you, got, you need to think about whether or not you want to start start down that road. Um, another older person said, well, we just need better communication. You just need to let us know what's happening, and if we object, we'll bring it to your attention, and then you can hold up until we have a meeting and talk about it. Uh, so the, this effort was to make sure everybody kind of understood the, the, the processes, has a common understanding of, of, of the processes. Um, I'm still not sure what your pleasure is. On if, if there is a property and action is warranted because of an accumulation of junk or a derelict building or structure. Um, except for demolition, which requires the declaration of a nuisance and the process that Mark has outlined. Uh, how do you want 
Dave and me to approach that. Yes. I don't have a problem with what we're currently doing, except for the fact, like in the most recent incident on St. Genevieve Drive, we had action going on, uh, a couple of police vehicles out front, you know, watching the situation and all that. People coming to me and asking me what was going on with the abatement issue, and I didn't know anything about it. So that's uh, the communication issue. Right. So I don't have a problem with the process that led up to taking action. I have a problem with not knowing that action was being taken you know, the day that it was, so that I don't get bombarded and not know what's going on. That's it, a it wasn't an issue. Legitimate point. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. I have full faith in our city hall staff to make those decisions, but just better communication <coughs> of when action is going to take place, if that makes sense. No, I understand, totally okay. understand. What about dollar amounts? Anybody will set a dollar amount? or Well, they only have a certain spending level anyways, right? That no, there's, a, there's no, we don't know. I mean, no. it's, but I mean, you have the authority to approve up to a certain level, anyways, don't yes. you? Or is that just for purchases? That's purchases. Okay. I but I usually apply that to contracts as well. I don't, I mean, I'm getting into a contract I, over $5,000 without your approval. I would like to see a, a budget line item on, yes. on the next year's budget for this. That's many, issue. many communities do that. Yeah, I mean, we have enough run time. Certainly, we have we've done enough properties where we know the average of those properties would be X, and we know times X number of properties because they're already existing on a list. So, let's shoot for a, a budget line item for that. But in the interim, well, it all comes to the board eventually with the, with the bigger projects. The, you know, it has to come for a hearing, so you can also decide that you're not going to order the abatement. Yeah, but take it. Don't take it. So you're going to be involved in that process. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly be involved in the dangerous building process. Yeah. We need to table a hearing. Yeah, it's more the, 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 I mean, the, the, the grass cutting is a relatively minor expense. So, right. you know, it's the debris and junk removal that can run the dollars up. And, uh... Okay, thanks. Yeah, we've got three minutes, three, two to three minutes before we start a meeting. So. so will we continue this agenda prior to the closed session? Because I think some folks came for that we, third item. Uh, I would hate to ask them. Certainly we can okay. do that. Yeah. Thank you.
United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Mayor Hassler. Here. Alderman Smith. Here. Alderman Johnson. Here. Alderman Donovan. Here. Alderman Jokers. Here. Alderman Jones. Here. Alderman Rainey. Here. Alderman Prince. Here. Alderman Wolfen. Here. Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Approval of the agenda. Move approved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, that takes us to a presentation and award. Is Joy here? You got to come is. forward. You got to come forward. <laughs> Y'all know who Joy French is? Do you see this big, beautiful mural over here? That's the lady that, okay. that put that on that oh, one. So. <laughs> I thought it'd be a real good idea to recognize her today uh, because it is beautiful and it's just, uh, it's just outstanding. Thank you very much. So this is a certificate of appreciation where St. Genevieve holds the distinction of being Missouri's first permanent settlement, as such is, has a rich and varied history, having been blessed over many years by dedicated individual, visionary organizations, excellent schools, and colorful traditions. And Joy French, a retired art teacher, had a vision for a beautiful mural to be placed in a prominent location so that it could add a touch of color, conveying the rich tapestry of our city's unique history, and in doing so, creating a lasting vision of our shared civic pride. And through her vision, dedication, creativity, and hard work, she has completed a beautiful mural at the corner of Fort Street and Market Street, depicting the many aspects of St. Genevieve's past and present, which will remain a significant expression of public art for future generations. Therefore, on this day, November the 14th, 2019, we present the Certificate of Appreciation to Joy French for her accomplishment. Thank you. Maybe I assume you don't want to make a speech. Well, I was going to thank her. Good, thank you. Then. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, just do it. <laughs> well, I had a list. <laughs> That's good. Oh, okay, go to the podium. <laughs> yeah, why don't you go to the podium? Why don't we get a microphone and yeah, be on TV. TV? That would be great. Thank you, Mayor, for that. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank my family and friends who were supporting me through the, the ordeal of putting that um, painting on the wall. And I would also like to thank my history, history consultants, Jim Baker and Bob Mueller, who's here tonight. And also um, Richard Fig, he had some ideas to add to that. Also on technical advice, I consulted Leon Bosler and Charles Reinhardt with some good ideas. Uh, I would also like to thank the Quarry Workers Local Union 829 for the use of their building, and David Bova and Mayor Hassler for their help here in City Hall, and also the Heritage Committee, um, Casey and Donna, Martha, Leanne, and Frank, and also the um, power washing that was done by Tommy Rettler. And there was also a trailer and scaffolding that was put up by Jeff Viox and Gary Roth, which we decided not to use after all. But a power lift was provided by Greg Hilbert, and I want to thank him for that. And also Jim Worth and Brian Drury, who painted the um, primer on the wall for me. And also Marzuko's, who donated cardboard so I could make some templates for the letters and the County Do It Center for paint the ordering all the paint supplies for me. And also the Anvil restaurant, they donated a delicious meal because of the blacksmith that was painted on the wall. And all of the people that stopped while I was working and appreciated the work that I was doing. And I just want to thank them for that. And also I had the Valley Preschool come by one day while I was working and they asked me all kinds of questions about it. And then the people that have been uh, taking photographs of it and sending them to family and friends all over the United States, I've heard so far. So, and even to Europe and parts of places. So just want to thank everybody for that and thank God for the talents that he's given me. So. Report. 
Well, um, Gary's here. He can uh, supplement the report on the overlay work, but uh, it's complete. Uh, we met with Representative Joe Kirsch to discuss a couple of items, a couple of matters, uh, adjustments on the. Uh, we wanted to, to uh, confirm the tonnage, so he and, and a Representative from Joe Kirsch went out today and took measurements. And there are a couple of uh, issues on manholes that need to be addressed. Uh, there's the uh, pond on uh, Park and uh, it, it, in Cedar that, that, that has yet to be repaired, but will be this year. We not, I was a little worried when the weather turned that he wouldn't be able to get back to it, but uh, Joker's going to do it. Yeah. Uh, and um, so it, 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 everybody, that, that other than these kind of minor things, everybody seems to think that this was uh, the right thing for us to do. Um, there's a group that's been meeting, a uh, regional group that's been meeting on environmental quality. It started out with air quality when the, 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 the area was getting ready to be given a moratorium on new development because of the ozone depletion based on monitors that are in, in, in the southeast region. Uh, that seems to have been addressed. Uh, they expanded it to environmental quality to pick up uh, some water quality issues based on some other work that was being done regionally. Uh, but the interest in the group seems to have waned now that we're not under the, the gun. It, 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 everything's kind of worked itself out, so uh, that group's going to probably just go back to meeting on an as-needed basis. Uh, I asked uh, a soils company with which I have worked in the past to come out and take a, take a look at the building and, and the water problems uh, with the idea that maybe we could figure out okay, with some physometers basically holes in the ground where you measure water, uh, what the nature of our problem is. Uh, an engineer came out and spent about, a, I don't know, several hours wandering around the building, uh, went back and said, you know, I, we can drill holes and tell you you have water, but you already know you have water. And, and, and I've sent a copy of that report to, to, to each of you where they're not recommending we do that. Uh, they, they do recommend, however, that we do outside drainage rather than interior drains. Um, but uh, the question now is, at least a couple of you that I've talked to, is uh, shouldn't that be designed? I mean, you know, when start digging holes and putting pipes in the ground and, and, and thinking you're doing the right thing. So uh, uh, I have an email out to an uh, engineering company that was referred to me when we started this process for to see if they would uh, do the design work, and uh, I will hopefully hear from them. I uh, had a couple of meetings with people uh, relative to uh, the property on Progress Parkway. Uh, that will be the subject of our closed session. Um, the uh, when I proposed to you the internet antenna lease on the on the water tower, several questions were asked about engineering, making sure that it was structurally sound, uh, and uh, we wanted to give uh, Mark an opportunity to opine. Uh, he has. Uh, the, the engineer expressed some concerns. I sent all those off to the company. They have responded and, 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 and have addressed the issues, the liability issues, and, and kind of the maintenance long term, whether, whether there's going to be a lot, any long term maintenance consequences. And so uh, we'll, be, we'll be working on that. Um, the um, levy district meeting, they have adopted the resolution that was being discussed tonight. So. They, uh, it's the same same resolution, but they also participate in getting FEMA grants, and so they were uh, asked to do that. Um, I went to the SEMO Transportation Advisory Council meeting. That's where every quarter we meet with the representatives from MoDOT. Um, they advised us of grants that were available for our traffic safety equipment, and uh, I have advised Eric. They do things like those radar. Uh, stands, you know, to read the, the speeds, and you can get grants for that kind of thing, for speed guns, for anything that, that, that contributes to transportation safety. Uh, and uh, so Eric's kind of taking a look and is going to come up with some recommendations for application for those funds. Uh, the also talked about, and I don't know if you guys have been hearing about the need, that there's a desire on the part of Missouri to replace the Chester Bridge because of the fact that it closes now, like every year. Uh, 
uh, it's no longer just talk. Uh, they're, they're, they're pursuing it, and uh, the next step for MoDOT is to uh, get their IDOT involved, uh, because both sides have to agree, and it's a shared expense kind of thing. But uh, they're estimating that it could be something that, not finished, but it's kind of on a six to eight year funding project, which when you think about replacing a major bridge over the Mississippi River, really isn't that long. So it's, uh, I was kind of surprised that it's that short term of a, of a plan. Uh, David had the rental housing committee meeting. He's going to report on that. Uh, we've had a couple of meetings with Leighton. Uh, I've informed you of my attendance at conferences where they always talk about cybersecurity and what you do in order to protect yourself. Um, that caused us to, uh, to cause to, to receive late them when they came in and said, you really need to review your cyber security coverage and your insurance. So uh, they have a relationship with a specialist on this, and uh, we've met a couple of times to talk about it, and they're going to engage this person to come down, and we're going to kind of review it. He basically said, you've got a $25,000 coverage now for something that if somebody stole your data, you know, to, to time, and he said, you know, it, it, it wouldn't take long to go through that on a consultant who's going to come in and rebuild your water billing system. He said, just so you really need to, to, to figure out what, what your potential costs are, we can insure it. And I asked him, I said, you know, is it one of those things like it cost a thousand dollars to insure your building for a million dollars, but if you insure it for a million two, it's a thousand and one dollar? I mean, when, when, and he said, yeah, it's kind of like that. It's not going to have a major impact on your, on your rates, but, you know, you don't have the coverage when the time comes and you can't collect. So uh, we're going to look at that, and I'll, I'll report to you on that when, when we get the figures. Martin, wouldn't a, a good part of that process be doing some sort of an assessment of how secure things are right now with the current company that we're using and all our current systems that are in place? Before okay, we certainly not something I'm qualified to do. Okay. But uh, is that something we, we can we look do. into? I mean, we are following the things that I have learned in, in terms of backing up uh, daily or more often than daily and making sure you're not the low-hanging fruit when hackers are out there and give them, you know, they have to jump through at least a couple of hoops because they won't spend the time to do that. They'll just move on to the next opportunity. Uh, we've, we've addressed those issues. Now, I haven't had a third party come in and evaluate it. Is that what you're suggesting, an independent? I'm not sure. Um, possibly. I'd like to see what, what that might cost us to have some sort of assessment, because I know Alderman Rainey and I had a couple issues with our email, and I would hate to see what other issues might be out there. I'll inquire as to what services are available along those lines. Thank we'll get, you. Get back to you. Thank you. Martin, thank you. Any idea when the pit's going to be cleaned up? Mm -hmm. The pit downstairs? Gary's about to make a report. I thought he already did that. No. Okay. Well, you ask him. Mm -hmm. He was going to do that last week. Okay. That takes us to uh, any other questions for Martin? Nope. Takes us to staff reports. I don't see Kenny here tonight. He's no, he has to work. He's working tonight? Okay. So you all have, you've seen his, you all saw his reports in your packets. Uh, so I'll go ahead and go to David. Hello, oh, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, Got my report there, historic preservation. Uh, Here's commission met again in October when we begin next week. Uh, they continue to work on economic hardship ordinance that may come before you in the next few months. Uh, you've got numbers there on building code, or I'm sorry, uh, permits. Rental Housing Advisory Commission, as Martin mentioned, meant November 4th and have presented two ordinances uh, to you for adoption tonight that will be just we can discuss later um, and then now they'll return to quarterly meetings so they'll meet again in January February unless there's something that presents itself that they need to discuss uh, planning and zoning I wanted to make one important update there you'll see there's no current applications to consider uh, if we do have a uh, Legal description of the five acres in Progress Parkway will certainly uh, do the rezoning there. The public hearing that was previously approved uh, for uh, special use permit number 8-19, which was at 1040 Rozier, 
was originally <coughs> planned for December 12th, 19, and up until today continue to be planned, uh, but they requested a uh, move to January. So the Department of Health and Senior Services still has not issued the approved licenses for the medical marijuana facilities. They have until December 30th to do that. So they think that they will know for certain by the first Board of Aldermen meeting, most likely in January, whether they will have their license. And they asked if we would put it off until then, seeing as there's no reason to go through with it unless they do get state approval. So that will be the, as, as it sits right now, it'll be the first Board of Aldermen meeting in January. Uh, on floodplain management, it says nothing new to report, but I do want to uh, kind of reiterate what Drew was here talking about during the work session, that this, is, this hazard mitigation plan is just that, it's just a plan. It'd be like you at your home making a plan for what you'd like to buy in case of emergency. If you choose not to buy it, you choose not to buy it. So it doesn't commit us to anything. I will mention that on his way out, uh, Drew mentioned that the resolution says hazard mitigation plan updated 2018. That was his mistake. It should say there were updates made just this past spring, so it's be updated 2019. So, and that's really all I have. Any questions? Thank you, David. Thank you. Get a red book. Good one. Good evening. Good evening. You guys have my report. We'll run through it. Uh, we put up the tent and took it down uh, and the stage in the park for an event that was up there. <coughs> Cleaned up after flash flood. We hauled off a load of scrap. Uh, we painted doors on the bathroom in the park just to give them a different look, change the colors. Uh, painted bowl, poles on the basketball court. We cleaned out the ditches alongside the firehouse so there wasn't a drainage issue on Pine Street anymore. Mm, well, we during the flash flood, we had to dump the brush we hauled off on Front Street on our property because we wasn't able to get to the brush site, so we cleaned that up. We put up the 15-minute parking signs for Common Grounds, put up the no-turn signs on Washington and 8th Street, poured the two storm drains at 4th Street for the paving project, and we added some outlets outside at the Main Street Park, which was beneficial for the pumpkin glow. We installed risers on the storm drains on 3rd Street for the paving project. We worked on the snow equipment. Install, installed a new sump pump in the pits in the basement where you put a commercial grade cast iron pump in and piped it to the outside. And in the process of that, we piped the existing pump out the same way so there's no water hole out in the parking lot anymore. Started changing the downtown street lights out to LED, and we painted the intersection at 4th and Market and the crosswalks over the new paving project. So, relative to uh, the sump pump in the basement, uh, Alderman Jones is curious as to when the debris that's in the pits is going to be hauled out. Uh, well, it's going to be combined with Steve whenever he gets ready to. Oh, the downstairs pits. Yeah. Yeah, we got to do that yet, I know. You want to give him an estimate of when you're planning on doing it? Within the next couple of weeks. There's, I mean, only a few things in there, so. How did your salt usage go this past? We used very little. Really? We had probably maybe 25 tons, if that, yeah. Once yeah, we got, once we got a little longer. You water, ordered additional salt. Yeah. The salt is actually taking delivery tomorrow on another 100 tons, so. Any other questions? <coughs> Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Any committee reports? <coughs> uh, we can. Yeah, how about you? Yeah, like hear. Hear. yeah, I'd like to hear what you got. We, uh, in Stop Me, Bryant, Jimmy, uh, I misspeak here, but uh, I think it's still fact 
finding mission for us, uh, gathering costs. Uh, what we had done today is we've had Woods come in, we've had uh, Helotech come in. The building here. The building here, yeah. Okay. So what, what we envision our, our mission to be is deliver some report to help people make up their mind in should we, should we stay in the space we're in and improve it to make it more uh, manageable for the people that work here. Should we uh, look at another property that already exists, like the Elpers building, or should we entertain the idea of what it would cost to build new on property that we already own? So we continue to gather those costs where we can. I think where we're held up now is an understanding of what it would take to make that basement proper in, in the building that we're sitting in. Um, I think our desire as a committee, what we've talked about is it, it makes almost no sense to us to do any improvement to the building unless we take care of that down there. So if we're alone in that, now would be a good time to let us know because that's the direction that we're going in. Um, and I don't feel like we're making decisions. I feel like we're just fact-finding to, to put a report together so the eight of us and, and everybody else involved uh, can come and sit and make decisions about how we proceed from that point. So I think one of the things that we need to do, uh, we need to look into the SCI uh, effort, what, what that uh, repair uh, would cost, you know, so I mean. I mean, the problem with that, Alderman Jones has addressed is what repair? I mean, they, right. They, they, they recommended an approach, the specifics of which, however, remain kind of unknown. We have a proposal, but it's not a design. You know, if the, the, the contractor's willing to, to, to stand behind his workmanship and materials. Right. Well, in, in, in my mind, in a, in a vacuum from my one seat, we have three entirely different approaches to, to the problem. So maybe circling back on the back end of that, going to an engineer again and saying, hey, help us evaluate the options that we have to, to pick what we think is the best option. I, I just, I don't think we're ever going to get to a, you know, an exact course of action recommended by somebody that everybody feels great about. But I, we just need to make the best decision we can. So I think that's where we're at. When SCI was here, did they shoot any <laughs> elevations around the building? Or that no? I don't know. Okay. You know, because it sure seems on the bank side over here, um, you know, some of that parking lot seems to pitch this way, and that's, I was disappointed in their evaluation that they didn't have grades and those type of things to tell us more. I think certainly if, we, if we're missing something like that, we need to add that to some... Really? Because when I walked with them over there, it looks like it sloped the drain away from the building. I don't know, but I think it's something that should be checked well, we in an overall it. assessment. Right. Yeah, well, you've got to look at everything. Yeah, I don't you can't just look at our property either. I mean, the bank is draining, what, three gutters onto, directly onto our problem area? And sometimes the problem's not with our property, it's what we're getting from other properties. And where so exactly is our, the property line over there? Our engineers need to look at their property as well when they're looking at our problem, because it may not be something we can do if they don't take action as well. Bob brings up a good point. Where's the property line? I think it's pretty close to our Yeah, I, mean, I think so, but I've never had to, you yeah. know. Do you think so, Pam? Yeah. Like I was told it's basically that parking spot, the, the, the car length from the building is, mm -hmm. is the end of our property. Was yeah. what I was told. Again, I've never actually researched it, but. Well, it's offset too, though. I'm oh, sorry? It's offset here too, right? To go, then to go in, uh, on the police end of the building? Yeah, I would, I would have to check. I'm not yeah. entirely sure. You know, one of the things also, Mike, is, you know, I know you've got some other ideas and proposals, but dealing with water once it's inside the building uh, <coughs> still leaves issues of right. mold and right. increased humidity and those type of things, but, you know, getting it before it comes in, whether it's cost thing or whatever, uh, you know, anytime you let that moisture underneath the footing, you know, you're allowing settling and a ton of other issues, even though this has probably been going on for a long time, but... Um, can't, can't disagree with you, I think. 
right. water not entering the building would be mission number one. Right. And if it can't be achieved, I would think mitigating the result once it's in the building. I'll read one sentence right here from their report. It is very difficult to determine where the water is coming from. Well, if you don't know where it's coming from, it's pretty hard to fix it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how we determine where it's coming from. Is it the surrounding building, which apparently they haven't done? Well, I thought they were going to install these things. Well, they will. Time. He's just saying. Yeah, but we weren't given anything to even address a cost of an well, end. You know, the meter. Right. So we, this was just his initial visit. He's eight. Well, you guys want to spend some money? It's it's we just it's. I don't have no problem doing it. I agree with you. Well, but I think we need to get cost like these things. I don't know what they cost or. Yeah. If another engineer says it's not necessary. I don't know how you're going to fix something when you don't know what it is. I mean, right. Right. Well, you might, you got to realize, too, where you're sitting here. The water's coming downhill and you're sitting next to the creek. You, 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 you can do everything you want to the outside of this building, and chances are it's going to come up through the bottom of the building. And, and once, once we give you guys a report, that's an important thing to consider in, sure. in the options. Sure. So, yeah. Well, but you need to be prepared also. It may be a multitude of things, you know, you may have to address outside, then you may have to address some inside also. But he also right. says the exterior drains could collect and remove water before it enters the building. Right. So. I wasn't, you know, that grab that's, seat that, thing was the part that's that That's the third opinion off. we've had, and they're all, they've all been different. Yeah. Right. You know, you can't gravity feed water out of the building and stuff over into a creek and mean flash flooding and check sure. valves and mm -hmm. flappers. I mean those are all issues but can't disagree. That's, so our, our work continues and we have why, been working. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I know, well I, I talked to uh, Mr. Donzi today and let him know what everything that was going on and he agrees with us and you know, he's but he, I think we, we owed that to him, you know, let him know that, hey, we're, we're still looking and we want to make the best decision we can for it's not our money, it's just taxpayers' money. So he understood that. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Thank Mike. you. Hey, thank you, guys. Okay. Well, at this time, we're going to, at 628, we're going to go into a public hearing. <coughs> The, uh, the St. Genevieve Board of Aldermen will hold a public hearing to determine if the detached garage structure at 777 Jefferson, owned by Joan Mobley, is a public nuisance and if an order of abatement should be issued. I'll get to that document. What you're getting is the findings of fact. Uh, conclusions of law. Um, this property was brought to the city's attention approximately February of this year. Uh, talked with the owner, Miss Mobley, and she had agreed to work on it, uh, but through different uh, factors, was not able to get the work accomplished. Uh, after six months, uh, allowing six months, uh, we began the formal process and uh, you have some of those letters in the packet that you received yesterday sent her uh, and the other owners a letter back in July uh, providing 90 days to abate the nuisance. Uh, that 90 days expired approximately October 26th, I believe, and then provided her a personally served letter uh, stating that we were going to have this hearing. Um, she's here tonight. Uh, I want to go through the findings of fact, though. You can see there that uh, St. Genevieve Municipal Code Section 215010 defines nuisance. I'm not going to go into it <coughs> verbatim, um, but the following structure, uh, which is included in the photograph at the back of the packet, the detached garage structure with listing and buckling western wall and severely collapsed roof fits the definition. Uh, number two, St. Genevieve Munis Municipal Code Section 215210 and 215215 declared dangerous buildings to be public nuisances and defined dangerous buildings as any building, mobile home or structure which exhibits vertical, vertical structural members which list lean or buckle. It goes on to have a further description there and also improperly distributed load upon floors or roofs in which the floors or roofs are overloaded. Uh, 
dilapidation, decay, unsafe or unsanitary conditions that contribute to the health, safety, or general welfare of the occupants of the city and parts so attached that they may fall and injure members of the public or damage property. The following items are visible in the included photographs. The west side wall of the garage lists considerably and has bowed in the center and is now actually collapsing. The load of the roof cannot now be held by the vertical structural members and has collapsed. The collapsed wall and roof create an unsafe condition for other city residents. The garage sits very close to the western property line, has shown an increased level of deterioration over the past three months, and could collapse onto part of the neighbor's property. Uh, going forward uh, in that document, you can see that uh, Saint, uh, Municipal Code 215020 makes it unlawful for any person to maintain nuisance within the boundaries of the city. Municipal Code 215045 allows an, auth an authorized representative of the city entry onto private property at reasonable times for purpose of determining the existence of the violation. Ms. Mobley is the majority owner of the property located at 777 Jefferson in the city of St. Genevieve. Based on St. Genevieve Municipal Code, it has been determined that a nuisance exists at the property located at 777 Jefferson. Documentation was made in the form of photographs taken on July 25, 2019 and again on November 4, 2019 to further provide the existence of the nuisance. Verbal contact was made with Ms. Mobley on February 4, 2019, March 4, 2019, July 25, 2019, and again November 4, 2019. A letter was personally served to Ms. Mobley on July 26, as outlined in the Municipal Code 215220. A copy of that letter was also sent to Mr. Rodney Greither, Mr. Jeremy Greither, and the St. Genevieve Catholic Church on July 26, 2019 via regular U.S. mail. A notice was posted on the detached garage on July 26 as outlined in municipal code. You have a picture of that notice attached to the building. And then a letter was personally served to Ms. Mobley on November 4, 2019 as outlined in municipal code 215040, notifying her to appear before the Board of Aldermen here tonight. That provided 10 days notice and again was given by personally delivering the notice of public hearing as outlined in municipal code uh, for her appearance here to show cause if any why she should not abate the nuisance. Based on the facts, the detached garage at 777 Jefferson in St. Genevieve, Missouri has been declared a public nuisance based on section 215.040. The St. Genevieve Board of Aldermen directs the community uh, development administrator to order Ms. Mobley. This is the conclusion of law. I guess I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but uh, to abate the nuisance within 30 days, that's part of the ordinance that Mark discussed earlier, the 30 days, or other, such other time as the board may deem reasonable. Uh, the order it goes on to describe how the order will be served. Uh, if you so choose to order that abatement, I will personally serve that uh, in the form and fashion uh, prescribed in the ordinance. I provided you, I think, yesterday or the day before with uh, the pictures and copies of the letters that were served. Uh, any questions for me? Yes, sir. This, this uh, little retaining wall here, is that the property line? Yes, sir. Yes. It is. Yes. <coughs> yes, that is my property. It belongs to me. And I've tried several times to get a hold of someone to try to help me, and I get no response or they won't let me do any payments. I live on Social Security and SSI. I'm not saying I don't want the shed down. I do want my shed down. But as of now, I cannot. I had to have surgery, and which I told the officer, the, uh, David, about it. I had to have surgery on my hand because the window fell on it, crushed it like a cracker. I won't be able to use it for six months. I'm the only one that is able to do anything with the garage right now because my sons will not help me or anything else. The church has signed off, so the church has no liability to it right now. It's just me and my two sons. Yeah. And I, you know, no one wants to work with me to make payments or anything else. I did have a gentleman um, that is a tree trimmer. Uh, Paying something. He said he'd do it 150 bucks 
and the very next day he's messaging on Facebook, I can't do this because the city won't let me do it. So then that blew that one. And I don't know what else to do. I mean, I would love some help. I've asked for help, and I'm not getting it, you know. I live on $750. I pay everything with my Social Security. And I take care of my ex-husband, which he is here right now. I mean, if somebody can suggest someone to help me, I'll take them. But everybody is wanting $750 up front to $1,000 to bring the garage down. I do not have it. At all. So I'm up to suggestions to someone. Have you gotten any costs? Not at this point. <clears throat> Do we know of anybody who, or have you sent any information over to anybody that would be able to help? Or um, I don't know if Miss Mobley remembers, but back in uh, July, I gave her a few contact numbers of local organizations. And they were good. And I'm not sure, um, she had told me also what she told you about the service she reached out to recently. I have no idea what the statement, the city wouldn't let us do it, means. What's the church's interest in the property? They were one of the original five owners. Ms. Mobley stated they are not any longer. Yeah, I, yeah. They, they've signed they off signed on the property. It was a it's, the title to the home is a beneficiary deed, is what it is. It started out with five, nine down to three. So what's before the board is uh, to determine if it is in fact a nuisance or a dangerous building and to order this uh, when we want to date uh, and give her a period of time to do it. If she doesn't, then presumably uh, <coughs> the city would then hire a contractor or do it itself and remove it and submit a bill to her and put it as a special tax bill and then it'd be up to her to pay that bill and there's, there's no, there'd be no legal impediment to accepting payments from her yeah, to pay that bill. So exactly my fault. What was, what was that last part? There, there's nothing to keep you from accepting payments from her, the monthly payments from her to pay off the the balance due on the, the cost. The, the, the difference is, is we have to be a little more prudent in our hiring, and, and we're going to have to get prices, to yeah. pick a contractor, and right. ensure the proper disposal of the material. I mean, it's not going to. It's not going to be seven hundred fifty dollars. I'm, I'm right. guessing. Uh, the, this is not beyond our capability, though. As a team here, we can. We can well, you, you declared a nuisance. We will order her to remove it. She won't. Right. Her failure to act in a prescribed time will lead for us to then hire a contractor and get it removed. That cost will become an obligation of theirs, which they can pay back however they choose. Right. Uh, until it's paid back, however, it becomes a lien on the property and stays there. Is she willing to do that? Basically, it's not that I don't want it to get down, and I'm not neglecting that it needs to come down. That's what I want the board to know. I'm not saying, no, it don't need to come down. What is it the status of the other down. two owners? You said there are two others on the deed. Two, two of my oldest boys and me. There's three of us. And they're not, they don't want to be involved, I understand. Will they, will, I told them. Will they be involved enough to kind of sign a waiver or something? <laughs> I, but I, I call the boys. I talk to the boys all the time. And I've told them about the situation. Well, my oldest tells me, Mom, you live there, you deal with it. And I've gotten that attitude since my mom has passed away. I was told 
Kenny Williams told me to call John Stoopy. John Stoopy told me to call Heavenly Hope. I called the number and not received nothing from Heavenly Hope to help me. The problem is you got there. This is not a, it's a dangerous situation. I understand you that. You can't, that building could collapse on somebody. It's it's not where a group of people should, should without some kind of experience, go in there and dismantle this building. Or somebody could get hurt seriously. It, it sounds like we've talked through the resolution, though. It sounds like we all are in, in agreement and well, we just get a payment plan going. Right. Afterwards. I mean, really what's before you is, is I got a little ahead of myself too, but what's before you is whether this is a dangerous building. Right. It is. And she stipulated it's a dangerous building. And so you go through the process. Right. And it's not up to her to agree to make payments. It's up to us whether we accept the payments or whether we take another collection efforts should you decide it's a dangerous building in order to remove it. But, uh, like I said, there's no impediment to accepting that and working out an arrangement with her as it goes forward. But, it, you know, if it's a dangerous building and it's stipulated by her it's a dangerous building, it has to be removed. It's, it's I, you know, but as a legal advisor, I'd say declare it a dangerous building, move forward with it, get it removed through the, the proper process, submit a bill, and, and the, the, if, if, she, if it's always better for a landowner to have the initiative and pay the costs up front because it's, it, it may be better uh, uh, cost-wise, but that's, uh, and she still has 30 days to do that if you order it to be removed. And if she doesn't, then the city's going to have to take charge of it, and then the process will flow from there. I mean, it's, it's, it's agreed, and then as far as the other owners, they haven't appeared. So they don't really have a, they're not objecting to it. Uh, so you, you conducted the hearing, you've had evidence, so unless there's more evidence, mm -hmm. I would suggest you move on to, uh, to make your decision. But she is, she's, feel, she's, she's free to present whatever evidence or testimony she wants to, in addition to whatever she's, she said, I don't want to cut I mean, her off. But. If you guys are willing to give me more time, I'll try again. I'll try to get someone to remove the garage. You are going to have more time. You'll have, you'll have more time with this, but it's going to I mean, be 30 days. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's whatever you guys agree on. I, I, I understand that. And if you could ask the gentleman who recently told you the city wouldn't let him, have him call David Bova and see what he thinks the hang-up is. Maybe maybe this something can be worked out. Maybe there's just some confusion. David, that's a tight space to get into, right? Oh my God. Yes. 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 Very tight. You're not going to be able to You'll probably have to get permission area. from some neighbors and come in the other way. Okay. I'm going to make a motion to approve this as a public nuisance. Uh, it's like finding the facts. I'm, conclusions of law. Thank you. I had a question for Mark. If we determine in this structure there's some hazardous material, what happens then? The contractor will have to properly dispose of it. Yeah. That is correct. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. With 644, the, we'll close the public hearing. Thank you. Is there any public comments? No public comments. We got the consent agenda to consider. I make a motion to approve, I'll second. but amending that it's the item number four oh. is updated 2019 as noted in the work session. So we'll have a first, first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Thank you. Takes us to old business. It's a second reading of bill number 4327, an ordinance approving a tax exempt equipment lease purchase agreement with First State Community Bank for the purchase of two police cars. <coughs> Motion to approve. Second. second. Have a roll call, please. Alderman Smith. Yes. Alderman Johnson. Yes. Alderman Donovan. Yes. Alderman Jokers. Yes. Alderman Jones. Yes. Alderman Rainey. Yes. Alderman Prince. Yes. Alderman Wolfen. Yes. Eight yes, zero no's. Bill number 4327 now becomes ordinance 4255. Thank you. Takes us to bill number 4328, <coughs> an ordinance calling for the general election of officers of the city of St. Genevieve, Missouri to be held April 7th. 2020 and providing notice to the general public. 
Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Have a roll call, please. Alderman Wolfen? Yes. Alderman Prentz? Yes. Alderman Rainey? Yes. Alderman Jones? Yes. Alderman Jokers? Yes. Alderman Donovan? Yes. Alderwoman Johnson? Yes. Alderman Smith? Yes. Eight yes, zero no's. Bill number 4328 now becomes ordinance 4256. Thank you. Takes the new business, bill number 4329. An ordinance approving the purchase of a Crown Gravel Star 10-foot dump trunk bed from William Novi and Company Incorporated. The amount not to exceed $11,950 for the street department. Motion to approve. Second. second. All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Motion for a second reading. Second. Please. All in favor of that? Aye. aye. Bill number 43, the second reading of bill number 4329, an ordinance approving the purchase of a Crown Gravel Star 10-foot dump truck bed from William Novi and Company Incorporated. The amount not to exceed $11,950 for the street department. Motion to approve. Second. Have a roll call, please. Alderman Jokers? Yes. Alderman Donovan? Yes. Alderman Johnson? Yes. Alderman Smith? Yes. Alderman Wolfen? Yes. Alderman Prince? Yes. Alderman Rainey? Yes. Alderman Jones? Yes. Thank Eight you. Eight yes, zero no's. Bill number 4329 now becomes ordinance 4257. Thank you. It takes us to bill number 4330, an ordinance amending chapter 715. User charge system section 715.040, user charge rates of the city of the St. Genevieve Municipal Code regarding water use charges. No approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Okay. Who? Ayes have it. Brian right. to us. No. Right. Bill number 4331, an ordinance amending chapter 715, user charge system section 715.140. Sewer charges and billing subsection D of the St. Genevieve Municipal Code regarding sewer use charges. And before you approve that, there's a typo under D, the second, where it says $8. That's supposed to read 816. Hmm. Oh, okay. Is that 816? Yes, the same as what it is in the first line. It's just a repeat oh, okay. of what it was up there. Thank you. Okay. We're waiting to entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Thank you. Bill number 4332, an ordinance approving a bill proposal from LE Upfitter LLC for the purchase of seven body armor vests for the police department, the amount not to exceed $6,191.50. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to have a second reading. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Be the second reading of bill number 4332, an ordinance approving a bid proposal from LE Upfitter LLC for the purchase of seven body armor vests for the police department, the amount not to exceed $6,191.50. Motion to approve. Second. All in, uh, roll call, please. Alderman Jokers? Yes. Alderman Jones? Yes. Alderman Rainey? Yes. Alderman Prince? Yes. Alderman Wilfen? Yes. Alderman Donovan? Yes. Alderwoman Johnson? Yes. Alderman Smith? Yes. Eight yes, zero no's. Bill number 4332 now becomes ordinance 4258. Thank you. Bill number 4333, an ordinance amending the City of St. Genevieve Code of Ordinance, Chapters 215, Nuisance, Article 5, Dangerous Buildings, by adding Section 215.263, Pre-HUD Mobile Homes. Motion to approve. Can we? Or, Second. I want to have some discussion on this if possible. <clears throat> well, it's sure we can have some discussion. After a motion and a second, which you have, now's the time. Mm -hmm. okay. David? Yes. Come up real quick, please. Thank you. I promise you, hard copies of these pictures if you need them. There they are. Thank you. Yep. So I know I asked this the other day in your guys' meeting, and, and I apologize for the That's all right. <laughs> um, what, what is the, 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 need for this ordinance as in why, why is our current ordinance is not covering any of these issues mobile homes aren't covered under the international building code particularly pre-hud mobile homes there weren't any codes they were built under uh, recreational vehicle codes um, so I, for, I apologize back I forgot which ordinance was first on the list um, Pre-HUD. So the adoption of the one ordinance uh, that's being added to Section 500.110 is basically putting 
an existing manufactured housing code that's in the International Building Code book into ordinance. All we're doing is adopting 18 pages of the International Building Code that's out there that exists that has to be adopted into code. It's just currently not adopted into code. It does not um, affect obviously the construction of mobile homes because they're constructed according to HUD regulations and HUD facilities now. Uh, it it, it uh, allows us to hold these structures accountable to code when it comes to alteration, repair, foundation, anchoring, those types of things. Now as far as pre-HUD, again, uh, I sent you multiple pictures of to kind of support what I'm saying. The pre-HUD so pre June 1976, mobile homes were constructed to recreational vehicle standards. Um, I'm going to read what I wrote here because it'll help me. Pre-HUD mobile homes have an elevated risk of deterioration and creating a hazard, whether that be nuisance, fire, or health, due to the use of I don't want to say poor construction materials, but lesser construction materials. Uh, prevalent in, in those structures prior to HUD, regu HUD regulations. In particular, some pre-HUDs have aluminum wiring, which creates a greater risk uh, or chance of fire. Uh, I will point out that we've had two structure fires in the city in the past year. One was a pre-HUD mobile home. Um, lack of proper egress to protect the health and life of the occupants. Uh, rolled metal roofs that, if not properly maintained, uh, allow water into seams. That's really the gist of most of these structures problems. Uh, flooring attached directly to the girders with no insulation. So it's just half inch, five inch, inch plywood attached directly to the girders. Uh, and very little fire blocking materials compared to more modern homes. Um, so over the past year, I've been in three trailers. Here I go again, trailers. Pre-HUD mobile homes. Um, that one we deemed uninhabitable, two, the other two, uh, we advised folks not to move in because it wasn't going to pass occupancy. I've submitted to you those pictures. These ordinances will allow the city to hold those structures more accountable, uh, to maintain a healthier, safer, more secure environment for not only the folks who may end up living in them, but definitely the folks around them. Uh, it provides a more specific standard for these structures, uh, puts improved and consistent standards in place for mobile home inspections. Uh, it, lim it does limit any further pre-HUD mobile homes from entering the city unless they either meet those standards or this board approves it for some reason. I was asked about why that stipulation and my answer to that was, let's say there is a natural disaster of some sort Mobile homes need to be brought in. The eight of you without inspection can say, you know, let's let these in for right now. That was my thought process there. It also puts process in place for addressing abandoned and significantly damaged mobile homes uh, while also allowing those working on vacant mobile homes to continue doing so up to a year. So as long as it's not a nuisance, there's a grass growing around it, it's secure, it's not falling over, they can continue to work on it and improve it. Uh, and it allows those who currently own and occupy mobile homes as of this, as of today or whenever this is adopted to remain under the same ownership and occupancy without any further stipulation. We do have occupancy inspections. That's part of current ordinance, but no other further stipulations unless it changes ownership or occupancy. Yes, sir. Does that answer? I'm sorry, Jimmy. Does that answer your question, Brian? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. How long can they be vacant without being declared abandoned? Well, we made a concession. That's one of the ones that we did, that they can be vacant. We, we gave up to a year before we would, they still wouldn't be abandoned, but we could proclaim them or, or, or try to get them uh, to become a public so, nuisance. So, requirement that a structure be occupied. Correct. There's a requirement that it be safe and occupied or not occupied, it's subject to inspection once a year. So abandoned would be the owner is nowhere to be found. The taxes aren't paid. There's a definition in the ordinance. Um, there's a few stipulations there. Maybe you want to tell the rest of the board what some of these landlords are doing. 
giving them away? Um, get rid of them? I mean, if it, I feel like a broken record here. I, I've said this at multiple meetings, and so has the mayor. Um, some of these less scrupulous owners or are offering their mobile homes to less off people who can't afford to make the mistake to begin with for $500. And it's like buying personal property, so like a car. So you hand over $500, you now own this wonderful 1975 mobile home. Uh, in some instances, those individuals through communication with mayor or other individuals have asked for us to look at their mobile home and we go in and you have the pictures in front of you of what they just bought for $500. It's not livable, it's not safe, it's not secure. I put my foot through the floor, light fixtures are falling in because the ceiling isn't sealed, uh, the roof isn't sealed. I could continue to go on, but I think you get the gist of it. <clears throat> I want to make clear too, this is not all. I, I, I drove around town, I don't know, Tuesday or Wednesday. I count approximately 46 pre-HUD mobile homes in town. This is not all of them. There are good landlords. There are people who make effort. And, and, and I think this, I call it participative rulemaking. They've engaged the owners of these homes and had meetings where landlords came and provided input and changes were made as a result of their comments and, and their input. So, uh, unless someone watching thinks that this was just a bureaucrat drafting a set of rules, uh, it, it wasn't. It was, no. it, was, it was. It was a good process. I was at quite a few of them, and I was here the night. Of the, all the the landlords were here. And there were some good comments and good questions. And keep in mind, there's two landlords on the Rental Housing Advisory Commission. Yes. Uh, there were six landlords present at a work session at the end of August. Uh, I know I sent this to you, but. You know, they made, I think I said 12, I was wrong. They made 13 requests that night, and we placed 12 of them in these revised documents. So they asked, I'll give you an example. <laughs> Instead of having a screen on every window, can we just have one screen in each habitable space, living area, bedroom? Yes, we're fine with that. Though that's just an example of about 12 concessions we made, nothing to compromise the safety or security or health though. Are there any other questions? How many um, how many mobile homes are do we see are there an issue currently? What kind of issue? Uh, you said out of the forty three or forty six that we have of pre huds. Of those forty six I can tell you three right now are uninhabitable. Um, three are abandoned to the best of my knowledge and are gonna head the same direction and water's probably just coming in them at certain points um, so until I get in them I can't tell you I can tell you of the 46 you know if we hopped in the car tomorrow I could take you to two or three that that look great from the outside and I could take you to two or three that you wouldn't want to put your kids in that's for sure last question yes sir uh, could you Kind of elaborate on on really what's the difference between for basically I understand the the abandonment uh, uh -huh. ordinance but between the other two ordinances yeah between 430 4333 and 4335 uh, which is I don't have that so there is so this is the abandonment ordinance here so there's 4333 is the prehab mobile homes mm -hmm. so it allows no further prehab mobile homes in town unless it meets those standards or the eight of you deem it so it addresses abandoned prehab mobile homes it addresses um, prehab mobile homes 4334 adds definitions to already existing definitions it places the definition of a vacant mobile home a mobile home an abandoned mobile home into existing section 4335 adds to the building code. So it adds that 18 pages that I sent you probably last Friday into the existing code. 
Do I have a first and a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Thank you. Takes us to bill number 4334, an ordinance amending the City of St. Genevieve Code of Ordinance, Chapter 215, Nuisances, Article 5, Dangerous Buildings, Section 215.210, Definitions. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Bill number 4335, an ordinance amending the City of St. Genevieve Code of Ordinance, Chapter 500, Buildings and Building Regulations, Article 2, Building Code, Section 500.110. Code subsection B, International Residential Building Code adopted is set forth below. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. No, again. Sorry, the again wasn't necessary. Uh, any other business? Now we have uh, some discussion. How are we going to do this with the... So we're not going to adjourn the meeting? No. Right. Um, there's consideration of open bargaining. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, no, Under I'm sorry. I missed that. Yeah, yeah they, we'll go to the, the uh, consideration of establish a burning of time for open burning. Starting right now. Till... Yeah. Say we do that, open burning till... I, you know, I can go all the way through the winter, and, and I would say the, at least the end of May, because you're going to have spring of the year coming on. Can we do that? It's pretty windy. It gets pretty windy in March and April. Well, we, yes, David. Was the hazard mitigation resolution in there? That was in the. Yeah. Uh, okay. You can say it. I apologize. <clears throat> well, if we I mean, approve it, ordinance that prohibits burning, if you're going to do that, you might as well just repeal the, hmm. the ordinance that prohibits burning. You're going to say it. Yes, it's just allowed for burning for six months. Is it the six months it bothers you or is it just the, the length of time? Yeah. Okay. That'd be because it, you, so, the so ordinance is unenforceable. I mean, what, why do you even have an ordinance saying that you can't burn if, if you're going to every six months say you can? Um, well, the only other question I had for you, you said we can only look at that twice a year or to that's do what the, the ordinance, I think, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think the ordinance allows you to set a period of time that you can have open burning. Or if it, it doesn't. I think it allows it in November and again in the spring of the year. Right, right. So that's how it was set up. Okay. And I'm not saying, you know, you shouldn't allow that. I'm just saying if, if you're going to, if you're going to do it, you might as well repeal the We have to decide on the first regular meeting in March or November. Yeah. But there's no limitation on yeah, how long guess, you can do it. Yes, you can say, well, you know, we'll, we'll allow, allow burning until March, and then maybe revisit in March. So we'll do that. Is that all right, yeah. everybody? <laughs> can someone make, do we need a motion? Yeah, yeah. you need a motion to second. But that can also be suspended from time to time at the advice okay. of the fire department as well, if right. conditions change. Mm -hmm. But if they, I, I mean, if they suspend it, is it suspended for the whole length of time? Or can they lift that without... You know, if I'm sitting out there you know, taking care of my yard, how am I supposed to know this? <laughs> I see on social media all the time people confused about, is it open burning, is it not open burning? I think if we're going to do it, we need to be very clear with our communication. And I, I honestly would prefer it limited to the end of the year, and then we look at it again in March. Especially since the fire chief's not here to weigh in, I kind of like his opinion as well. <laughs> well, I think it'd be safe to say we just we could open it to the end of the year, open burning to the end of the year, and look at it in March. Okay. It's not a problem. They have, you know, so so I have a motion. Motion. I have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Thank you. And can we make sure that gets? I mean, how do we communicate that normally? That, it, that we've established. Paper. It'll be in paper. We, we can put it on Facebook. Paper. Paper. Right. On our website. Yeah, we, we can also put the rules and regulations. They still apply even though you yeah. it, this sure. not open burning. So we can put that on there as well. Yeah, that open would be burning great. doesn't mean you get to. Right. Paper. I just yeah. think that yeah. there's a lot of confusion about that. It'd be nice if we could reiterate what, yeah. what those yeah. rules and regulations yeah. are. So we're going to go back to our. Uh, now, what are we doing? Nothing. We're going to. Uh, not adjourn this meeting, but suspend it, and then uh, resume, the work session. resume the work session. Okay. Uh, with regard to the tourism. 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 tourism.
So we're gonna make a motion to suspend this meeting. Or do we need to do anything? Yeah. No, he's just doing it. Oh, he's just doing it. Good job. So uh, you're all aware that uh, Sandra has announced that she has an opportunity to go to work for the state of Missouri, and uh, we'll know she has resigned for, as the tourism director, effective November her last day is the November the 30th, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of discussion about tourism budget during the budget process, uh, and it's kind of a high-profile position. Uh, so uh, I personally didn't want to just treat it like any other unfilled position in the city and find somebody qualified to fill it. Uh, I wanted to bring to your attention so that we could discuss it. Um, the, the things that have been discussed is whether we want to uh, continue to employ a person who is responsible for managing the Welcome Center and marketing the city. Uh, Sandra has the ex extra duty of economic development in cooperation with the county. I don't know that we find somebody like her uh, who could handle all those things. Um, the other option uh, that has been discussed is uh, whether or not marketing, assuming uh, it could be could be contracted out, in which case then it's a matter of having someone responsible for managing the Welcome Center, employing the people, making sure it's properly staffed, taking care of the building, and uh, keeping it keeping it open to receive to, to receive visitors. And I, on that, we uh, had a meeting just here off to where we had a meeting with uh, I think last week with Mary Lee's, and she's agreed to to kind of step up into that management role keeping track of the employees there, that there's going to be somebody at the Welcome Center. We're not going to miss a lick when the when buses come to town. She's going to do what she's always done and work with that to, to schedule that too. So it's been, it's we've talked about it just temporary, you know, but uh, we, did, we did talk to her and she has accepted that. So one of the it's good things we're coming into the, it's going to be a little slower because of winter time, but uh, we, we have to have somebody down there manning our welcome center and directing people. One of the considerations that I've been made aware of is we have a grant from the state for marketing. Um, the city um, is a certified, what is it, certified CMO. CMO marketing organization. I got another certification for historic preservation. Uh, and that that requires a full-time person. Uh, I don't know that since we're in the middle of a grant year, a change now probably wouldn't affect our current grant, but it might affect our ability to, to apply for grants in, in the future. And, uh, and, and what we also don't know but think is probably acceptable is if we had a facility manager and a contract for marketing, that would kind of satisfy that full-time uh, requirement for the grant. Um, but that's a question we, we would have to ask, assuming you'd want to you'd want to go that way. So, it's really the reason we're here is for you to direct me, and uh, as to what my next step is. Bob. You know, one of the things that came up in our discussion about tourism and stuff is who all benefits from it. That's one of the things I would like to see is some type of joint effort between any entities that benefits from it, whether it be the county or, you know, to help fund our efforts. Well, <clears throat> We can ask, but I don't think you're going to get much help there. I really don't. You can always ask. You don't receive. You don't ask. You know. I still firmly believe we have to. We need to market this city. It's our responsibility to market the city. We got to do that. I agree. I just yeah. think what's it to hurt to ask? Because right. I think there's other entities that you know, mainly the county, that's benefiting, you know, from some of our efforts and stuff. So I think we need to. I, I agree with Bob. Obviously, asking after things are already in place weakens your position, so now is a good time. And what all those entities might be.
Well, if you're going to ask the county, I think we asked the uh, chamber also. What about the IDC and? Uh, I don't know. Well, yeah. I, sure, <laughs> we could. We'd always ask. I mean, their charge is to use the resources they have to make loans for economic development. Yeah. Uh, whether they would be, yeah, I'm not that familiar with their charter. Whether they can fund ongoing operations is a different question. So, but I'll find out. So, are we are we discussing the the overall? tourism issue here, or are we just discussing personnel issue? Uh, I, I guess I'm a little confused on, on, on what, what you're asking here, uh, Martin. Well, normally, I have a position open. I will find a qualified person to fill it. I will employ them uh, to implement the program and the budget that you have already approved. Uh, this is not a normal situation. Uh, because of, you know, but that's that's within the scope of my responsibility and authority under the city the city codes. I, I know this one's different, so it, <clears throat> because of discussions that we've had, I wanted to let you know want to consider alternatives. It's your government, and. And, and, and I will do what you, the elected representatives of the citizens of St. Genevieve, decide is in the best interest of the community. You, but you have to tell me. Uh, if you don't tell me, I'll do my job and I'll put out an advertisement and fill the position and we'll move, we'll move on. If you want me to do something different, tell me now. Yeah. I have a question. Who sets the salary? You have set the salary by adopting a budget for that position. No. Well, then you're going to have to change the rules. Of well, the, section one, 115.060, Board of Aldermen shall fix the compensation of all the officers employees of the city. So that's what the code says. And we have always interpreted, unless you want to change it, that that's, what, that's the approval of the budget process. But you also said we can change the budget. You can. You can. Okay. So is, for you, Jimmy, is it just a, a matter of the salary? What's a matter of what, what, what person you're going to hire? Are you going to hire somebody to run a welcome center, another person to do marketing, somebody else to do economic development? And it's got to be not, something. We didn't talk about hiring somebody for e We're not even talking about economic development. I mean, we had that part time, but right. and it's something to talk about, right. you know, absolutely. So. Uh, well, that's why I suggested that all the entities right. involved in stuff, if we're going to, if somebody's going to participate in funding this thing, then it ought to be a joint effort right. in funding. And But I agree with Jimmy and stuff. I think it should come in front of this board because it is such a key subject and a hot topic, you know, that we at least be included. That's why we're having this <coughs> the, the, right. the session. Well, I've heard from several people. We had quite a few come and talk to us during the budget process in defense of tourism. I haven't had a single person tell me that we shouldn't fill the position. I have. I have. <clears throat> okay. Tell them to give me a call and let me know what they think. Because I'm, I'm thinking about all the people that have shown up over the last few months. And those are the those are the people I think we really need to consider. Well, there's also people that watch us on TV that don't come to the meetings, that express their opinions. I would love to hear their opinions. Okay. Do, do we find ourselves in a position then when we can define that position? Like if we had 90% effort to tourism and 10% to economic development, can we adjust those levels? Can we... I mean, is that is that what's on the table here? We can we can rehab that whole position. Are you talking about just salary or the whole? I'm talking about the mission statement of of that position. Yeah, the job and description. I, yeah, and I'm asking because I don't know if, if that's what's on the table here. I also heard the opportunity for us to look at what Sandra did, which was mammoth 
in my opinion, with respect to everything she did. Um, possibly having marketing contracted out, Good which I think presently makes sense to me, and then finding a welcome center manager. And then which would be a, I mean, you know, a lower position. Right. And pay. And, yeah, and, and you pay. also lower pay. We also have some talented individuals in this community, in the downtown, that, that know how to market and Facebook. There's one guy sitting back there. It's Iggy, isn't it? Yeah. yeah he's <laughs> he's on the uh, downtown, uh, St. Jen downtown, and very good at marketing and, and promoting. Oh, there's no. There's the other one there, Nicole. She's the same way. They're <laughs> talented individuals, and I'm sure that's why they're here tonight. So. And then I, I hear that the third piece of that, if you will, would be economic development. And I think that's what you're targeting, and I right. think that's a pretty good idea, too. So I don't know how Sandra did it, but she, to my mind, she did marketing, economic development, and she was the welcome center manager. I, yeah. think, what, I think what we're saying here is we're looking at marketing and contracting that out you know, getting bids and finding companies that can actually do it for a certain fee, for a fixed fee, and then reducing the job description and therefore in kind the salary of the welcome center manager, but then we still have to consider economic development. Is that what you, is that, am I on the right? Okay. What, what economic development were we getting out of the position already that we would be losing if, if this were to happen? I, yeah, I'd have to do, I, I'd have to defer that to Sandra. Sandra's there to answer that question. Well, so there was $5,000 of my salary that was paid by the St. Genevieve IDC through the county. And so I was working to move forward on issues of economic development on behalf of St. Genevieve. $5,000 you could take off of that salary and you would have what's left for the tourism bureau. Did they, 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 they put the, Sandra, was developing information, maintaining the data, had established connections with the state marketing, uh, the Hawthorne Foundation and the state, the, the, what's the other, uh, Missouri partnership. And, uh, you know, so she developed all these, these, these relationships. She wasn't doing economic development in the sense of prospecting, going on trips, calling on industry, trying to attract, I mean, that, that's what, I think that's the that's what Perryville's doing as a board. That's kind of what we're. When you say that, that's what is expected, and I'm, I'm and trust me, I understand that's a lot more than five thousand dollars of a of a job, uh, but but when we say hey, we're also looking into economic development. That what you just described is what is what, what you think we of. We think of. Or, oh, well, not everybody. I'm sorry, but it is but, expensive. But, but I mean, yes. it's not. It's so, not five thousand dollars. Uh, basically, what I, I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to, and, and to circle back to what Gary's saying, is I, I'm not too sure we're going to be losing much if we don't find someone to do the economic development portion of of, of what Gary's describing here. Well, I do think we will be losing something, but I don't think Sanders the only one who could be doing that. Right. That, same, that same $5,000 could be spent well, at the Chamber of Commerce level, and, and for they could be doing those things. Sorry, Martin. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off, boss. Um, but what I'm understanding is if we take these into three segments, we could actually try to attack this from, we have $5,000 from the IDC, we could probably try and find funds from the county and things of that nature. Who knows, maybe it's a part-time position for somebody else or something, I, I don't know. But right now, I, I, my, mo my primary concerns would be marketing this whole beautiful city and then Welcome Center. And then I'll come back to Bennett as well after that. Just so I'm clear. Do we have any clue what, the, what kind of cost would be in, incurred with, with the third? That's what we'll have to find out. And Sandra and I have already discussed it. And she's inquiring at, at getting some names of companies that we could get RFQs from. And uh, we can get started on that process if that's the way you want to go. I would, and I for one, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, do you think we would lose our DMO designation if we outsourced marketing and therefore? It the would be worthwhile, sorry, it would be worthwhile to have that discussion. Uh, the requirement is a full time position. Mm -hmm. So if you have a welcome center manager, you would likely have a full time position. 
uh, it would depend on if that person had a supervisory role over the marketing contract. I think, I mean, I cannot speak for them, but I think that we could make a case that that would, that you could make a case uh, that that would meet those terms. It would be a full-time position with authority over that area. They just wouldn't have to be carrying out every aspect of it. So that would still make it eligible for those state grants? I cannot speak for them, but I think you can make that case. Okay, thank you. So Paula is the lady that you met with and stuff. I mean, is that a permanent position? She's, well, no, she's a part-time position, Mary. See, I don't think she's interested in the full time. No, I don't think she's interested in Mary Lee's. No, she, she, it's part-time, yeah. and so um, one thing they didn't mention it is that I've made the whole schedule out through the month of January. So they know exactly who's working what day of the five part-time people that work down there. The most senior of those is Mary Lee Sokenfus, and she is the one who the mayor and Martin approached to uh, take on this additional responsibility in the hours that she is there. So I've already begun the process of transitioning to her uh, all the additional um, knowledge that she needs to be able to carry that out over the next two months while you figure out what to do with it. So, if I have this understanding clear, then we're kind of we're giving Martin the permission to look forward to giving us some RFQs with respect to marketing, and to start doing his due diligence as he normally does when he tries to fill a position for welcome center manager and the like. Is that what? So you can move forward on filling that position. That's yes. It doesn't mean that. Is that what I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that direction. I yeah, do we need I to determine we need to. A, uh, a salary level of? If we're reducing the role of of this, yeah, I would, I, think, I would think a job description. What, wouldn't that be? If we're getting our FQs, couldn't we have? Couldn't we ask Martin to put together a job description? No, you'd have to provide right. a job description. Yeah. Mm -hmm. could, what I should have said was, could you present that to us as you present the RFQ so we can mull it over? And again, I want to say this real quickly, Sandra. You've been a blessing for our community, and I think you did a phenomenal job. And I thank you, and I wish you nothing but the best of luck in all your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I second that. Paul, do you remember a meeting that you and I attended with the National Parks? And the National Parks advised us to um, be cautious about changing our tourism plan because of the, I guess, the whole. Uh, how new the national park thing was, and all of the political eyes watching. Yeah, but one one good thing about it, the, the national park is, as of today, they hired a director for St. Genevieve. So we have we're going to have boots on the ground here, and Sanders really likes him. So I feel good about the guy. So he's an excellent candidate, and you're going to yeah. be very pleased, and they'll serve the community very well. Yeah, and I don't see this. I mean, I think abandoning marketing yeah. to be problematic, but I right. don't think changing our approaches will be. What's the latest on the National Park as far as? Well, right, uh, the latest on it is, right now there's not a lot you can say, other than we, we hired, they hired a, the director for the park. Uh, the, so they're, that's the latest and greatest news. And I, there's things in the works that, that will, will come out when, whenever they can. So right now is not the time and the place to talk about it, so we'll just go from there. But we do, we know the press release, we have a director. Uh, we're going to have better communication, I think, with the National Park Service, and I look forward to working with them. And I've had some conversation with the National Park Service, and they've assured me that um, I'll know more information, too, as we go forward. And I will we'll definitely pass that along to everybody, because it's going to benefit all of us. So. Sandra, did you have any other recommend, recommendations or suggestions? Uh, well, I, the two scenarios that Martin uh, laid out were the two that he and I and the mayor discussed. Um, you can either uh, fill the post and fill the position as is, or you can split it. And it seems, you haven't taken a vote, I suppose, but it seems like splitting it is uh, something several people are considering. Um, I know there are some excellent um, organizations out there that probably will be excited to respond should you um, uh, 
move forward with a request for proposals. Um, and I know there's some excellent people who would be interested in um, responding to either position, whether it be tourism director or welcome center manager. So, thank you. Okay, back to the regular meeting. <laughs> Okay, well, that takes us back to the regular meeting. So, is there any other bit, any other business? With that, I will uh, we'll call that meeting adjourned. Go closed session. No, somebody's motion, motion to go into closed session. I'm sorry. Second for real estate. For real estate. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Very roll good. Call. Roll, call. roll call. Alderman Smith. Yes. Alderman Johnson. Yes. Alderman Donovan. Yes. Alderman Jokers. Yes. Alderman Jones. Yes. Alderman Rainey? Yes. Alderman yes. Prince? Yes. Alderman Moulton? Yes. Right. 726. Yes.